Good morning, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started here. Maybe wait for a couple more people to file in. <coughs> okay. Uh, so my name is Kevin Yamauchi. I'm one of the organizers of this, of this event and a member of the Point of Care Diagnostics Idea Lab here at UC Berkeley. Um, the Point of Care Diagnostics Idea Lab is a student-run organization that aims to foster collaboration and also discussion about the implementation and development of point of care di uh, diagnostic technologies. Um, to this end, we host bi-weekly seminars um, and also events such as this one. Uh, today our focus is on the challenge of translating technologies developed to address global health needs from a research environment to the settings in which they're needed. Um, we've, we've invited a group of speakers that we're pretty excited about, um, and they're going to share with you their experiences working in this field. Um, additionally, we hope that all of you will participate um, by asking lots of questions, maybe building some DIY lab equipment with Tecla Labs later this afternoon, um, and of course, uh, meeting people during the breaks. Um, so our first speaker today is Professor Sam Sia. Uh, Professor Sia began his academic career at the University of Alberta, where he was awarded a bachelor's in biochemistry. He then moved to Harvard, where he earned a PhD in biophysics and was a postdoctoral fellow in chemistry. Uh, currently, he is an associate professor in the biomedical engineering department at Columbia University, and also is a founder of Claris Diagnostics. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Sia. Thanks, uh, thanks, Beth, and thanks, Kevin, for this uh, invitation. Um, so I, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I, I know there's a mix of people in the audience, but uh, this is primarily, as I understand, a student. <laughs> Uh, driven, student organized event. And, uh, and I was a student really not too long ago. And uh, I really, at that point, switched my focus from sort of doing basic science, which is quite interesting, uh, to something that's more applied. And I remember that pretty distinctly. And over the last 10 or 12 years, uh, we've worked on, on this uh, problem for point of care for global health. And so I'm really happy to be just try to share what I've learned uh, from our experience over the last number of years and, and hopefully try to uh, get to the end of this presentation, which, which I'm not going to take too long, but to maybe have, I think, one slide there suggesting maybe some ways forward for, for you guys, because I think the world that you're in now was actually different from the one that I was in even just 10 or 12 years ago doing this, even though the problem basically remains the same. Um, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, we had uh, increasing awareness of this problem for diagnostics for the developing world. It's really much more drugs focused at that point. HIV drugs were available, but they were trying to be, the prices were trying to be negotiated and so forth. And then uh, I think the lab on a chip field at that point uh, recognized the developing world, started to recognize that as an opportunity um, at that point. Uh, and then the rest of the world sort of recognized it as well as the drugs became disseminated in the developing countries. And people said, well, now that we have cheap drugs, that's great. But how do we know who to give it to? And then the problem came about, well, how do we know who, how to monitor the um, effectiveness? Uh, but um, but so I'll probably just get started here uh, and um, and talk and tell you about what what's happened uh, in terms of what we've done. Now the problem has actually still remained uh, the same, and that's been sort of I think for me part of the frustrating uh, part of uh, working in this area. So even back in 2003, um, the National Academy of Sciences (IOM) you know, was recognizing, hey, let's pursue science for global health. This really went beyond, before 2003, I'm sure. But, uh, but just speaking for myself, this was something that was seen as an important priority for the science going on, science and engineering in, in this country at the time. Uh, and so that was becoming increasingly important. The Gates Foundation in, uh, released their grand challenges at around that time. But I think the progress since this time has been really slow going, and it's been really disappointing uh, to me, anyway, uh, in the whole field. And so I wanted to at least tell you our, our attempt at doing this, which is, uh, which is still in progress. I wish we had, you know, are solving the problem already. But, and then again, get to the end where I think uh, there has been progress made, even though these devices aren't really out there in the field yet. But I think um, 
you know, you guys actually are in a better position than ever to um, try to solve this problem. So what we've done is uh, try to miniaturize the ELISA test. We're working on a lot of different tests now. Basically, anything you can think of in a lab, we're trying to miniaturize that using microfluidics, lab on a chip as one of the technologies. I don't think this is really a lab on a chip problem per se. Lab on a chip is one of the one of the enabling technologies. It's not really the only one. Uh, but uh, but the idea is we think um, you, you can take any lab based test and, and miniaturize it. And this is a problem that is solvable. This is what I keep emphasizing to people. This is not trying to discover a new vaccine for HIV or new drugs, you, where it's open-ended. You may find it, you may not. Um, part of the frustrating thing I, I feel about the, all of this is that all, all of these are bounded problems in engineering. They're completely solvable. They will be solved. You will be able to miniaturize ELISA. I think we have already. But other things, uh, nucleic acid tests, you know, there's uh, great work in, in this room being done, and that will be solved if not already solved. And this will go into personalized health for consumers in the U.S. as well. But somehow uh, it hasn't all connected together to make an impact in the developing world, and we're still sort of sitting around talking about this. But uh, ELISA has been the, the first uh, test that we've worked on, and it's the furthest one uh, along the path for us. And so it's you know $100,000 or at least tens of thousands of dollars of equipment, and you get a great result. It's the gold standard. You draw your blood, and the blood goes into a clinic. You get your results back days later, because even though the test takes a few hours just because of the workflow. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is, can you miniaturize this test and get a clinical lab uh, performance, but with a finger prick right on the spot in 15 minutes? This would be useful in the, the US, because in a doctor's office, they say, oh, I, I think you should have this blood test. Mm -hmm. And you can do the test right then and have the result and then have the conversation right in the same visit. Instead of all these coordination, oh, you gotta find a way to get your blood draw and then you're gonna make another appointment and so forth. You could do it all in the same visit here. And in the developing world, it's critical, uh, obviously, because the patients um, just don't even have access to these tests. So it becomes not just more convenient, but it becomes critical. So I, I'm not gonna actually talk about the technology too much. Um, I'm, but I, I do want to give you a flavor of what the technology uh, encompasses. So it's really just, I think, three parts of this technology that at least will give you an idea. Uh, the first one is reagent delivery. So our, our method is based on, uh, our philosophy here is to really take traditional microfluidics, planar microfluidics, originally done in silicon glass, PDMS, and we want to make it low cost. That's our philosophy, because we think that's fundamentally a sound, versatile, high performance technology. Just because it wasn't low cost before, it doesn't mean we can't make it low cost now. So it's sort of orthogonal to the paper-based work, which is take a fundamentally low cost method and make it work better. We're coming at it uh, from the other way around. Take a fundamentally high performance method and make it cheaper. Um, and so that's always been our focus, and I think uh, I still stand by that philosophy. I think in the future, uh, well, I'll come, I'll come back to the end. I think that's the way to go. Uh, and so um, we want to replicate ELISA pretty much the, the way it's, uh, it's done in every lab. And so instead of having a pipetting robot deliver all these different reagents, that's part of the strength of ELISA. You have washings, you have amplification, uh, you have low noise, you have high signal. Uh, we want to replicate that but without a pipetting robot. And so all we did, very simple idea, was to take all the reagents you need to run a full ELISA test and pre-pipette them into uh, a, a serial, uh, in, into just a straight channel or a tube and separate all the reagents by air bubbles. And so every one of these chips with these series of reagents separated by air bubbles will have all the reagents are needed to run that test and that's analogous to pipetting different reagents from uh, in, in an ELISA machine. And so at the end of the day, you have this sort of train of reagents, and, uh, and all you have to do is apply a vacuum, and they will all go over. This is the cross-section of the chip. And say you have a capture reagent in here. They will all, the blood goes through. Whatever is in the blood will get captured uh, in that zone. It's like a well in a multi-well assay. And then all your other 
uh, amplification washings, whatever, will go through as well to hit that one zone without any pipetting robots. So it's a very simple idea that maybe, um, you know, I was surprised when people hadn't looked at that before because traditionally you want to avoid bubbles in microfluidics. And so we were actually exploiting it. And then now, of course, there's a lot of good work with uh, multi-phase microfluidics. The second part of this is, okay, you deliver all those reagents to that capture zone. What is the amplification strategy? And traditionally in an ELISA, you have a well, you have an enzyme-linked uh, uh, antibody at the surface, and then you apply substrate. You get this great amplification because everything that's converted collects in the well, and so you just get all this great signal. But in continuous flow microfluidics, you can't do that because you just keep putting your substrate over that area and whatever the enzyme converts will be washed away. So at least the way we have it set up, uh, that strategy doesn't work, or else we would just use it. So instead, we went back to this old school technique from immunohistology with uh, gold nanoparticles and silver solution. And so you have sil the, the silver, sorry, the gold nanoparticle basically replaces the enzyme, and the silver reagent, silver solution here is basically the substrate. And so the silver is uh, deposited on the gold nanoparticle and it self catalyzes. So you form this huge amplification across five orders of magnitude in space. You go from 10 nanometer nanoparticles to millimeter thick films. You can see this with AFM, these gold nanoparticles, and they get, get, get amplified into basically an opaque film that you can measure uh, how much light goes through with very low cost optics. And so that's the other part of the strategy. You not only get amplification that stays on the spot. You can see the result using optics you can buy from Radio Shack uh, for 10 bucks instead of you know, using AFM or using some fancy uh, mic microscope. And so we still get the amplification and we can detect it with very low cost hardware. And so even here, I think the lesson is, you know, you know, we're trying to think about the system from the beginning. It's not just about any one component because at the end of the day, your hardware that you need to run your assay also needs to be low cost. And so you could have the most sensitive amplification strategy in the world, uh, but if it requires complicated hardware, that will never work as a point of care device. It, it, it sounds obvious, but um, you know, uh, there's a lot of work that goes on where people don't think about that because they, they just sort of say, well, someone else will solve that problem. We know we can get very sensitive detection Someone else will try to make our hardware cheaper, and that often never happens. And so thinking about it from a systems point of view is important if you want to develop something that works in the near term, anyway, if you want to do it all yourself. Uh, and, in the, and in this works quite well. I'll skip this in terms of the um, uh, silver-gold amplification. It works uh, as well as the benchtop enzyme substrate reactions. And in the third and last technical element I'll bring into this. We have fluid delivery, eliminating pipetting robots. We have amplification, just like you have in ELISA. And the third part is the manufacturing, because uh, you, this needs to be low cost. And so we, got a, uh, we, we try to address this issue again early on by, uh, by acknowledging that PDMS was probably not the right way to go. Uh, we knew that early on, uh, even coming from the white size lab, we knew that early on. And so um, we actually spent a lot of time, and when I say we, I mean primarily Vincent Linder, who was a postdoc with me at George Whitesides, and then he became the CTO uh, and ran basically all the science at, uh, at the company that we founded. And so Vincent really spent a lot of time uh, working on the injection molding to a point where I think uh, they do have the best injection molding technology in the world for making microfluidics. I don't say that lightly. I think he does have that now. And so this is a chip that you can injection mold. It's the size of a credit card, maybe a little bit thicker. It has all sorts of different channel sizes inside. Uh, but how this works is you have your reagents stored in the bigger channels. So you have um, amplification antibodies. And these are the zones uh, where you can detect different diseases. These are basically analogous to your 96 well plate, each well in a 96 well plate they can all have a different affinity reagent. So you run the blood through this zone and uh, everything is uh, kept on the filter pad so it doesn't come out of the chip. And whatever in your blood is, capture, is captured 
and then whatever is the reagents here are fo follow whatever is captured to to uh, get your silver gold uh, signal out, and then you simply measure the amount of light that goes through each zone. So that's uh, that's how it works. Do it in 15 minutes, and you get a quantitative result. And so. Um, Injection molding, the material cost per chip is basically less than 10 cents. And, uh, and so, again, if you want to compare this with sort of lateral flow assays, paper-based tests, the material cost is negligible in either case. Maybe for paper is, I don't know, one cent. Okay, for us is, you know, maybe five cents. I don't know. So, but the difference is, I think, negligible because at the end of the day, uh, the cost really comes from other things, from packaging, the tests, and so forth. So at the end of the day, it's going to be one or two dollars either way. And so we don't think uh, the material costs here is really an issue uh, of the plastics. So just to summarize, in terms of our technology, if we call this M chip here, the signal generation, we try to replicate everything we do in ELISA, but we use silver gold uh, reactions that, that's also used in photography in addition to immunohistology. We took it to our diagnostics. We had LEDs instead of uh, other more expensive optics, so very robust and low cost photo detector and injection molded plastic. A lot of techniques taken from other fields that are uh, maybe more consumer product oriented that we try to import here. So these are sort of the technical means that we have been inspired by to make a what we think is a fundamentally high performance microfluidic technology uh, that so many people have developed into something that is low cost and, uh, and, in fact, and still high performing, just by doing things a little bit differently, uh, but doing it all together so that it becomes a, a, a holistic test that, that works from start to finish. So uh, Vincent and I and, and David Steinmiller, who is the uh, business person, uh, started Claros, and we eventually raised venture capital funding now, our first uh, focus was on the developing world. And so I, I know when we even published this paper with George Whitesides, it was, I think, the first paper that we knew of where we talked about the developing world in, in the title, in the first sentence, in microfluidics. However, the investors uh, didn't think that was such a great market. They liked the technology. They said, you know, you've got a cool thing here, but, you know, if you want to do HIV for Africa, then, you know, not God bless you, but you know, good luck. And they said, but what about you know something else? Prostate cancer. It's a billion dollar market in the U.S. Thirty million tests done in the U.S. alone, reimbursed at 30, 40 bucks a test. Billion dollar market just in the U.S. Double that if you count Europe. Huge, huge market. And so we worked on prostate cancer screening and monitoring. And uh, and since then, uh, we you know we have a. There's a big manufacturing facility now at, at uh, Claros. They have a CE Mark product. The company was acquired by Opco Health, so actually I don't have anything to do with the company formally anymore, uh, even though my friends run the company, so I talk to them all the time. But the company was acquired by Opco Health in 2011 for $50 million. Uh, and uh, it's still going through FDA approval for the PSA test. And uh, I think I do have one slide here from the web page. Opco is a $4 billion public company that acquired us. And, uh, and they're working on uh, a, a panel for prostate cancer, which they are hoping to release. And so people complain about PSA. OK, I'm not here to talk about PSA, but they're, uh, but they're you know, PSA, as well as other markers that make uh, so, you know, you want something to replace PSA, right, if it's not that specific. And so they have a panel of markers that they think is going to be uh, the replace just the PSA test, total PSA test. They're working on other markers as well. But none of these other non-prostate cancer tests are neglected disease markets, right? Vitamin D, actually, it's a huge market for vitamin D here. I didn't know that, actually, before that, even though we looked at everything under the sun, testosterone, Alzheimer's, maybe. But... Uh, but we have continued to work with them on the, on the developing world tests using uh, leveraging this technology. And I'll come back to that at the end on how, uh, how that can potentially take place. And this is the machine as it stands from the company. It's a benchtop size machine. This is sort of a credit card size that, that goes into here. And so you put your blood into uh, a capillary tube, which, is, which then snaps onto the card. 
and then you put the card in and you press a button. And 15 minutes later, you get an ELISA quality result. This does PSA, and PSA from an analytical performance angle is a pretty challenging test. You need to go down to 0.1 nanograms per mil, and you need to be quantitative at the same time. And so uh, they are able to reproduce that performance. So I think it's a pretty impressive, um, at least, uh, display of what they can do from an analytical performance point of view. And, and so it's a touch screen and so forth. Um, and at the same time, so where my lab has come in since I started my lab at Columbia in 2005 is we've worked with the company to try to have a second version of this test in the developing world. And so the, um, the plastic card and so forth, that's taken straight off the shelf. We didn't really need to uh, re rework that. Um, and um, yeah, well, just, I mean, so obviously in the developing world, you know, it's a different, it's not just about convenience, it's life and death. Uh, I mean, I think everyone here knows that. If you, if you can't diagnose the person, you don't know who, who to give the drugs to. But we really focus on developing a, a second version of the test that's really appropriate for the developing world. So we, we sent industrial designers with us to Africa, 2006, 2007. We got feedback and so forth to try to redesign something. Because that machine was a little too big, a little too expensive probably for uh, a lot of the needs in the developing world. It, you know, you need, to, you need to plug it in. It's not battery powered, for instance, so it's not really even portable. So the heart of it is, is good, but we needed to adapt it for, um, for the developing countries. And uh, so we worked with ICAP, which is a very well-known public health entity in the public health world. They're out of Colombia as well. And we worked in Rwanda as our uh, initial country. Um, after a number of years, uh, we finally uh, were able to uh, get everything together. And, and it is a challenge to try to do this uh, just, you know, I mean, we spent half the time, you know, in the developing world just working out how to collect the specimens. So it's, it's a logistics challenge as much as a technical, technological challenge. Uh, even though I think that there are technological challenges in developing such tests um, still. But after a few years, we, uh, we published our first set of results on 400 patient samples on location in, R in Rwanda. We tested the device in Rwanda on HIV and, and syphilis. So this was a duplex test. We can test both HIV antibody and uh, syphilis uh, antibody, in this case, um, on the same card. And uh, the bottom here is usually what, what I like to show because what you see here is uh, if you're just shining light through one of those zones, which is analogous to looking at one well of an ELISA test, but one, one of our zones, so each of these squares, just look at that over time, you'll see that you get a wash, and then you get a sample uh, incubation, and then you get buffer washes, and then you get an antibody, you get more buffer washes, and then uh, it's, it's analogous to pipetting different reagents onto the well washing it out, incubating, washing it out. And then at the end, you, your amplification reagent comes and uh, you either get a rise in signal or, or you don't, depending on your result. So it's exactly the same as what you do in ELISA. And that's all we've tried to replicate, except now you can do it in 15 minutes and you can do it at the point of care anywhere in the world. And so we just want to run an ELISA, pretty much. Uh, and, and the results look good. You know, HIV results were partic particularly good given this uh, antibody antigen uh, combination. One microliter of whole blood is all we need, uh, actually. So you can get great results of whole blood. You don't need to spin it down. You can get great results. Syphilis was also good, but maybe not as good, which uh, was sort of known at the time given what these antibodies were doing. But we, we also got something that you would expect uh, from a lab performance point of view. These are um, some of the manufacturing technologies from the company uh, where you can uh, make, so the plastic cassettes, the production now, they're making hundreds of thousands a year at the company and they can make, uh, yeah, so that's how many they can make. And then the preparing the cassettes, there's robotics that can do that. And uh, you know, at this point, the company has leveraged tens of millions in venture capital. So we're trying to leverage that 
where they're trying to make their money in prostate cancer, whatever, vitamin D, we're leveraging that basic technology for use in the developing world, even though they're not focused on a developing world. And so there's a synergy here at play. And, and you know, uh, my opinion that I think I'll give at the end is that I think that is still the most likely route to getting this to work in a developing world. Uh, you know, the Cepheid system is uh, probably the best case that anyone has right now of a new diagnostics device that's out in the field. And, and they're also leveraging uh, their markets in the US in order to develop a product for the, for the developing world. And um, I think there are ways to do it if you just focus on a developing world, but then you have to spend a lot of money just coming up with the basic technologies. Uh, and, um, and when people are asking you upfront, you know, can you get the price down to a dollar or you know, or fifty cents? The margins there are um, are not attractive to really too many people uh, who are investors. So, I think this sort of dual market strategy, it was one of the ways you can do it. I, I think is a very likely route to getting this to work in the, in the future. This was some of the feedback we got from the industrial designers uh, when we went there. And so, uh, our device pretty much looks like this now, and so that's what it looks like. This is what their feedback was back in 2006. We built this device uh, for the developing world, the, which kind of looked like that, but it's cheaper uh, than the one before because it doesn't have the touch screen part for, for one, which is an expensive component. Um, you know, other ways, it's only got one button, so it's really hard to go wrong in the developing. You, you can press that button all you want, but you know, there's only so many things you can do with that. And the result comes out on an LCD display here. Uh, and you put the card in here. And the card is basically the same as, as before, uh, manufactured by, by Claros. And, and so we published a second set of results earlier, well, well, we published it last year, where we ran it on this device, which also communicates with uh, wireless uh, uplink. So it talks to your cell phone towers, as well as satellites. It does both, so you synchronize your, all your data with your electronic medical records. We tested this in Rwanda, and, and we, so I'm not gonna go into all this, but, but we published all the details of how we were able to engineer the, the size, the power requirements. Uh, nothing earth shattering, you know, so when people, sometimes people ask, you know, what, what's your secret, or like what, what's the biggest uh, thing that you did to make the device really work? It's really, we didn't, you know, it's really just systems engineering. It's just thinking about this really hard. I mean, I hate to say it, it's not that inspiring. I wish I said, you know, we found some big secret. But we really just worked hard to uh, find hardware components that, that really fit in and that work from, from start to finish. And so you can read this paper if you wanna see how we did it here. And uh, I think I have a movie that shows how it works. Some of you might have seen this movie before. We should probably take more movies, but this is the one I, I always show now. And uh, this is done in Rwanda. You put your card in the device. And uh, so the blood is uh, on that tube and it'll go, you press a button and then 15 minutes later, the result comes out. So that shows about 15 minutes. And then it'll ask you here whether you want to synchronize. Here are your results. Do you want to synchronize them with the electronic health uh, data? And so you press yes. That's what this big thing is. It, this communicates with satellites. The, the uh, hardware that communicates with cell phone towers is much smaller. But for satellites, we need something bigger. And so uh, if you want to talk to satellites, we have this extra module here. And you press a button, and the results will be sent. Uh, either way, uh, one way or another, to your to something anybody can monitor from uh, anywhere. And so here was is an email. The way this particular method worked with the uh, you can get GPS coordinates in there as well as the, all the patient data, and you can encrypt it if you want. And so uh, the idea now is you have something you can get a LISA quality result anywhere in the world. And the results will not only be, be clinically up, up to par, they'll be time-stamped and geotagged for you, and it'll be all automatic, so you don't have to enter in the data manually, which introduces errors. 
if you do 50 times a day every day, there's going to be some errors um, that's known. So that's sort of a device that uh, we would want to sort of, you know, a, a, a ideal device if we keep moving towards that, that you would want to have in the field. And this is just from the paper in terms of the performance, but uh, this is just HIV uh, for this study, and we got very good results. You can monitor the results from anywhere in the world. You know, someone just did a test here, and you'll, you can see that in real time. Um, and this is a result, a set of results that we also published in the paper, side to side by side with the lateral flow test. HIV, it's been done uh, hundreds of millions of times now with rapid tests in the developing world. It's probably the most uh, used rapid test out there uh, in the developing world. And these are five that people use. Orisher is the one that's FDA approved. And uh, Abbott, Determine, Trinity, Biotech are two that are used a lot in the developing world. We took a highly validated set of specimens, 25, highly validated from a commercial supplier and they ran it themselves on these five rapid tests. And red is where you see a discordant result. So even the FDA approved tests, as well as the ones that are used in the developing world, uh, give a wrong result compared to the latest Abbott Prism fourth generation ELISA. And they do so when you have a weak positive. So if it's a high, you know, the brackets is the actual quantitative number. For clear positives and negatives, the rapid tests work well. But when you have a weak positive, uh, by the suppliers, in the suppliers' hands, um, don't give you the right result. This is our result with AmpChip. We agree with the uh, Abbott ELISA test 100% of the time in N equals 25. And we even give you, we even classify the weak positives uh, correctly in most cases. Uh, so we run an ELISA, and uh, that's what we get, our ELISA results. And, um, and I think another advantage here is you don't need to interpret the result, and that's another uh, source of problem. When you have these tests, you've got to hold it up and say, is there a ban, is there not a ban? You know, am I pregnant, am I not pregnant? And, uh, and our machine just gives you that result digitally. You don't really have to interpret that yourself. So in real life, uh, you can, um, you can, uh, this is more controlled uh, in, in the field under real world conditions. So uh, we worked with a lot of different partners, public health, uh, ministries of health, engineering partners and uh, venture capital partners and so forth. And so I, I have a few more slides that are a little bit more philosophical after telling you what we, our story here, which is still in the works, is by no means, uh, I think a success story yet. We're trying to, until this actually is, works in the field, is sold in the field, is actually saving patients' lives, um, you know, we still got a long way to go. Uh, but our, again, our goal here is to replicate ELISA, same performance, but faster, uh, finger prick instead of a blood draw, and, uh, and the equipment is really not um, even a factor. And I think that's one of the differences uh, now compared to 10 years ago. I mean, you know, um, there was a acronym coined by WHO TDR called Assured, and the E stood for equipment free. And I joke with, you know, Rosanna Peeling, who came up with that all the time, I think you should re remake the acronym now because, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know why it should be equipment free because everybody uses smartphones in a developing world. That's a, that's a piece of equipment. And as long as it's cheap, it's rechargeable. And in our case, we can get the equipment down to a level where we can give it away to people in this sort of razor blade model. So why does that have to be equipment free? It actually introduces all sorts of control. It gives you, you know, objectively determined results. And it gives you high performance. And, um, and I think that argument now is much more acceptable than it was 10 years ago when people were shooting for the moon. You know, give me something that costs nothing and works, uh, works great. I mean, it sounds great. But now, with all this innovation and hardware out of the tech world, uh, people see that even in the developing world, equipment is not an enemy. If it's cheap, if it's uh, rechargeable, that's no problem with that. People know how to use it too. Another concern was people don't know how to use equipment in the developing world, which I think is against everything that um, a lot of us see in the field. So uh, in terms of where we are now with this technology, before I sort of talk more broadly, 
uh, we're in this uh, USA grant. The Gates Foundation is also part of it, and the World Bank and Canada and Norway governments, where uh, it's called Saving Lives at Birth. It's uh, for antenatal care. It's different technologies to um, for antenatal care, uh, and uh, out of the State Department. And so we're in the midst of trying to scale this up in a more practical way, in starting in Rwanda. And so we're still, uh, we're just starting year three of a four-year project. And hopefully we can uh, get something to work. I'm really, uh, I don't know, I'm really eager to just not keep talking about how, how this is really going to work and just have it work. And, you know, we're working on a lot of other things in the lab, and I, I, I don't feel like doing the same thing. It's like Groundhog Day every year. I mean, we are making progress, but... Uh, and no, we, we are making a lot of progress, but I think the whole field really needs to be a little bit more um, impatient because this is a perfectly solvable engineering problem. Uh, and some of the, you know, I'll show some unpublished results as well. This is my assured. Mm -hmm. That equipment, $100,000, we've been working on the next generation for about three years now. We've shrunk that equipment down to the same size as, uh, as a little USB dongle. That entire pipetting equipment. We shrunk it down to something that Claros developed for the physician's office into the version I just showed you that works in Rwanda. But the one that we've been playing around with for a while, all of that has been shrunk down to, to something that is really much smaller that you can totally give away uh, for free to people. Uh, that I don't really want to talk about right now. But I think hardware is just an equipment will be less and less, a, should be less and less of a concern uh, in the future in terms of cost and so forth. It's just like a cell phone. You know, if you can have a little cell phone that gives you great performance, what, what's the problem with that? Especially if it's free for people. Um, so we did publish this review, which uh, takes a kind of a practical look at uh, microfluidics in a practical way, which I would just refer you to. Not ju just talking about us, but talking about uh, other success stories as well. Um, and some of the considerations that should go into that. And um, uh, you know, I hate to keep coming back to this, but, you know, people, because people have been asking lateral flow and, oh, paper's cheaper, you know, because paper can be like five cents, you know, that's bigger. <laughs> These are the real prices of uh, HIV rapid tests on the market. It's not five cents because it's not about the paper. It's about all the things that go on into packaging it, all of that. Uh, so, so when people say, you know, wow, papers like doesn't cost anything. I mean, I, I don't know which test they're talking about because the market prices for these are, are known, and we are selling our, we will be selling it for the same price, uh, and we publish our Cogs breakdown for our test. The substrate cost is a fraction. So if you want to shrink that down, that's fine. So we can make our whole chip even, you know, take that away. But it doesn't really impact the final cost, and so. Uh, I, I, I just want to make that point, and I think everyone almost in the, in the industry world understands that. People in the academic world sometimes don't. Um, in terms of the public health uh, impact, we worked early on to look at public health uh, analysis, where we look at disability adjusted life years avoid and so forth. And I think, you know, this was started with by the Gates Foundation. They had a nature supplement that did this, and uh, for diagnostics, they they really. Uh, we're one of the first to do this. And so we took that analysis pretty early on. I think more and more people are, are looking at it now. But what is the cost per disability adjusted life year? Because another thing I hear in the field is, uh, you know, your test, we only care about your test if your test is, uh, you know, a dollar. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't even matter what you test for. That should be the target product uh, profile. And, you know, I come back to this. Uh, this is my final slide, I think of the Warren Buffett rule. It's not about, it's not about the cost, it's about the value. So I, I don't know how people can set prices without looking at the benefit that you can get from it. The, the cost that people are willing to pay and the public partnership should be willing to pay and that the market is willing to pay depends on the, val depends on, on the benefit that you're providing. So, and that sometimes I think is also missed when I see this, when we were saying, well, I, you need to be a dollar. You need to be, well, if you're doing a multi-drug resistant TB test, people are willing to pay 10 or $20 in the developing world for it. Because, it, well, it's very important. It saves a lot of people, you know, well, you know, in that case, it's uh, toxic drugs and months of uh, health issues. And, and so I think I'll just end off with a couple of slides um, on things that I've learned that I, 
I, I, are sort of just ideas that I think uh, in today's world, uh, if you're thinking about doing this now, especially if you're a student, uh, there's a few things I, I think might be interesting. Technology challenges. I think uh, device integration, I think, is the heart of the technology challenge in point of care diagnostics. Um, that's what that's one of my hypotheses was at the beginning, and I still stand by that today. It's not individual components, better valves, better detection. How do you put it all together? And there's not a lot of uh, people who really uh, are willing to do that. And so a lot of you know companies try to do that as well, but. Systems integration, that's how you built the iPhone. You know, it's like you've got to think about how to put everything together. And um, this sometimes is not given, I think, the attention that it deserves. You know, if you, uh, people, they want, they want something innovative, right, all the time. That's how you judge journals, grants. Uh, but systems integration on its own is the biggest challenge to impact. And, uh, and there's innovations there as well. Uh, so. Systems engineering, device integration, I think is the biggest technical challenge. And if you can get that to work, then I think uh, the whole engineering problem is completely uh, solvable uh, for almost all lab-based testing. Another part of this I, I just don't, I think people are starting to understand more is user experience, which is never talked about. Because you know, a lot of times with global health diagnostics, people come from the drugs world, vaccine world, where, where the compound, the drug, is basically interchangeable. It works or it doesn't. And so people, you know, what's your analytical performance of your device? You can have the best analytical performance in your device, but if it's clunky, it requires all sorts of equipment, people aren't going to use it. And even back with our prostate cancer product for the U.S. market, which, um, you know, uh, I, mean, I mean, people in the tech world now know, understand, it's almost all about user experience if you want people to use it even if you have different apps that, that deliver the same service, that really is a determinant. For a device, devices are not like drugs or vaccines. Devices are engineered a certain way. They can have the same performance, but be engineered in all sorts of form factors, different user experiences. That and the user experience will play a huge role in whether or not this device will be used. And so I think that is another lesson that, uh, especially in this campus, you know, we we are learning from the tech world, and that has to be paid attention to. Not, you know, it's not just about analytical performance. So um, that, to me, are the main technology challenges. It's, and I, I'm really optimistic. I think almost all lab-based tests can be miniaturized into a cheap, low-cost uh, technology. It's not about engineering, in my uh, view, uh, except for these two challenges. Business challenge, um, I think one is... Uh, this idea that I alluded to about how you make the economics work. There's two sides to the coin, revenue and cost. Uh, how do you bring in enough revenue to justify you know, the, the amount of money you need to invest into this to get it to work? I, you know, Cepheid is one example, even though their device is still quite large and so forth, but it's actually on the market. It's making a difference. It's better to have a large device that sort that works to some degree and making a difference, in my view, than something that you're shooting from the moon that'll never work. And um, and Cepheid does is capitalized by their focus on the first world markets. And so, you know, we're, you know, consciously or not, this is the strategy that we're choosing. And I think there are some good work, there is some great work in the field where they take an opposite position, where they say we're only selling in a developing world. Um, and uh, you know, we'll see what happens. But I think, uh, and I think that's great, you know, if they can get that to work, it might, there might be more than one route. But if you truly want to hit this really challenging target where you want high performing and low cost, it's a very high bar that people, you know, at Gates, uh, at other places, are setting, um, you're probably going to need a lot of investments, R&D investments, to get that to work. And it's sort of like a cell phone. You know, I think about this. Uh, you know, what if 20 years ago someone issued a grand challenge? We need to make an impact in the developing world. We need to have something that, you know, where people can communicate with each other uh, for the developing world. It has to be really low cost. How that happened was quite organically it, with all the investments that came out here and that diffuse into the developing world, I still think that's the most likely route. Uh, and so you, the, the, the uh, implication of that is that you have to give the people doing this uh, an incentive to work on it. 
And right now, the way things are structured in global health, I think it's you're actually disincentivizing all the private investors from coming into the field. I think this is a problem. Because people are saying, before you even have a product, people want you to say how much it's going to cost. And it should be a dollar. And that, OK, that's great. So you, you're going to have the philanthropists and the public uh, people funding this forever. Because nobody's going inter to be interested in touching it. And that's not how prices are set in the real world. And so um, I think it's a problem because the bar is so high, but you're shutting out all the private people from doing this. And the private people are the people who've shown that this is how it works. Cell phones with computers. One laptop per child is really not used all that much in the developing world. It's netbooks and so forth because there was a market in, here in the US. If you want to hit this bar in global health diagnostics, I think that's the most likely route, especially when you have uh, more technically uh, challenging tests. And again, I think this Buffett rule, I think cost, you know, it's not about cost, it's about value. You've got to think about cost to benefit uh, analysis. And so that's another thing uh, I throw out there. And finally, I would say in 2014 versus when I started doing this, there has now been a demonstrated tech revolution in both hardware and software that we can all leverage in building these diagnostic devices. It is a different world in how you'd synchronize data, wireless communication, uh, optical and mechanical components. It's very exciting. I think this problem will be solved uh, sooner rather than later if people think about this from a systems integration point of view. And finally, um, I'll draw attention to something I started recently, uh, a biotech incubator in New York City with the mayor's office. And uh, I see QB3 here. I had the chance to go to QB3 in Mission Bay yesterday. And uh, we're, New York is a little bit behind in the biotech scene. It's behind you know, Bay Area, Boston, San Diego. And uh, for this is another story, but uh, for some one reason or another, I started this biotech incubator in Harlem. It's called Harlem Biospace. You can read all about it. There's been a, a lot of press uh, recently about it. And, uh, and we're doing all sorts of stuff. But affordable wet lab space is kind of like QB3, basically. But we also have an element of design because uh, we're in New York City. We care about design. But the idea is, you know, this kind of encouraging younger entrepreneurs to come in with all their ideas from the tech world, design world, to solve these problems. I think that's the way of the future. We need to learn from the tech world, not isolate our biotech community from, from everyone else, from even private investors. I think that's been quite damaging to the global health diagnostics field in the last uh, 10 years. So people in my lab, Curtis Wan and Tiffany have been, uh, and Yuki also have been the main contributors uh, to, to this project. And um, uh, Claros uh, and, and other folks, ICAP has been a great partner and a um, number of funding agencies. And uh, happy to, uh, to answer any questions. So, thanks a lot. So paper versus instruments. I agree with you that the issue is not cost or cost of materials. I think perhaps the issue, is, at least in the short term, is that paper, I wouldn't call it paper, I'd say visually read test. With a microfluidics test, you have to have a reader, which means a couple of things. Instrument reliability, but more importantly, your test has to be made by the same company that makes the reader which means if you, want it, if you want a good test for every analyte, you have to wait for the few manufacturers of really good, really cheap readers to make tests for all those analytes. Whereas visually read tests, you can let the market sort out the good ones and the bad ones and either let them be read visually or read them with image analysis so that you, know, you basically have a universal access to the best tests that are out there, the ones that have found their way into the supply chain of the country you're working with, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So I think that's where the advantage, at least currently, with paper, uh, or should I say, visually read tests. Yeah. No, I mean this is an issue where I think you know reasonable people can disagree and, and do. But on, on those, I'll make a couple points. One, at least in our microfluidic test, you can read it in exactly the same way as uh, as paper based tests because the silver stays. You can read it with your eye. So uh, and we do that actually even in our original Nature Medicine paper without a reader. 
It's just the reliability you get from visual reading of that silver or whatever, a, a color band on a paper desk test is limited. And, uh, and you're gonna make uh, errors in, in interpretation. That, I think the reader uh, isn't optional, but it just gives you better reliability if there are manufacturers that, that are available uh, to make them. And I think the trend in a lot of the paperwork is actually to have those bands be read more and more. And so even though you know, that could theoretically be an advantage is that you don't have a reader, I think what people are finding, at least even in the paper field, is they're actually moving in the direction of having equipment to read it one way or another, whether it's cell phones, whether it's uh, other types of equipment. Cell phones, I think, present their own challenges. Your lighting condition, I mean, people are, cha you know, people are working on that, those problems. But I think the trend in paper, and I think the way the paper is gonna play out, if that works, is it will need a piece of equipment to read it, whether it's, equipment, whether it's a cell phone or other things. And that's another opinion I have, but that's also a trend you're seeing in all of these uh, uh, re research that's coming out. I mean, it's very hard to, re especially if you want quantitative or semi-quantitative results, even just you know, uh, beyond yes or no, one way or not. It's, is that red? Is that deep red? Is that, you know, it's very, it's, it's difficult. Mm. I'm sorry? It's a very small number of proteins or lead proteins. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, so, so that's why I think, you know, the lateral flow, HIV, there's a certain number of indications that are, that are appropriate for a high yes, high, high no, but the easy ones have been done already. Hi, I uh, learned that the OPCO has taken the PSA point of care test off market. Uh, would you comment on, if so, why? Uh... I, I'm not sure really that's true. That would be news to me. Uh, prostate cancer is their uh, main focus. Uh, you, might, you might be referring to the 4K panel then, be, which is uh, the replacement for the prostate cancer test. The 4K panel has total PSA as one of the four markers. It's total PSA, free PSA, uh, and then another two markers, intact PSA and another protein on HK2. So maybe some, you know, the way the telephone game played out, maybe said they took it off the market, but they're actually just enhancing that PSA marker to make it more specific. Yeah. And could you tell us a little bit about the HK2 marker? Uh, it's actually published. There's a whole literature on that. You know, uh, there's a website there. It gives you all the, all the publications mm -hmm. that talk about, you know, cal calicranes. You know, PSA is actually one, one of the calicranes. It's HK something. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's just adding the whole set of markers to make the diagnosis, to make, to make it more specific so it's not uh, benign indications that could give you an elevated tPSA. So uh, there's plenty of publications. If you just check the, four, if you just Google 4K score, uh, you'll find it on the OPCO website. Thank you. Hi, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your relationship with the company now in terms of you're working on these global health issues, you're accessing this technology. Is that because you were part of the invention of it so you can still access it? Do you have new agreements with those companies? How does that relationship work? Yeah, like I, I think actually a lot of it is just based on trust, believe it or not, even though they're public company and all of that, you know, they know me and they know I'm not going to, you know, do anything crazy with their technology. And I think that's a lesson as well. You know, if you have that element of trust, it's, uh, that, that works for everything instead of having things spelled by, well, I mean, we have signed agreements, but, uh, but in terms of their motivation beyond the trust factor, why, okay, is, you know, why would they even be working on this? You know, it has to be sort of built in a win-win-win uh, sort of scenario. For so right now, the way it is, you know, the way it's structured is, you know, they're not investing their own time and efforts beyond, you know, sort of what they can deal with in a very reasonable way you know, on this developing world product. We're pushing that forward, leveraging a lot of their technology, and so for them, it's, you know, they probably wouldn't have an interest in working on this. You know, these are billion-dollar markets. What we're working on in Rwanda and in the developing world is not a billion dollar market. There's no incentive for them to do it otherwise. But if they can get into that, I mean, everybody's a humanitarian. I haven't met too many people who are against the developing world people. It's just, you know, so if they can help them in a way that doesn't distract them and spend their money, they're all for it. And so, yeah, so I think that's, you know, it's a win-win and then if we make it work at the end, it's good for them. Hey, we're, you know, your technology is being adapted, it's great. 
Yes. I just uh, had a quick question in terms of the user experience. You mentioned it as one of the challenges. Um, could you get? Could you speak a little bit about your process in terms of understanding that user experience, whether it's the academic or the company side, and if you would change anything moving forward, or are there new processes that you implemented? Like, how do you go about that? Because usually, just you field test something and you see if it works, and you learn from there. How do you evaluate that user experience as you go through your iterations for design? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't claim that we have you know, all the answers. I, I think we have done a very good job compared to most people in our field because they just haven't thought about the user experience, so more just because nobody else is thinking about it, we've done a good job. But compared to what we need to be, you know, the tech world is great at this. And this is not a trivial problem you know, in having a user interface that people like. And so we're, we're trying to talk to people in Silicon Valley, learn from them, you know, uh, what, what goes on into uh, getting people to actually want to use your device. Uh, but field testing, you know, in the short term is really, you know, one great way to do it. Uh, three of my students are in Rwanda now, uh, testing the device with healthcare workers and just observing, spending time there, getting their feedback. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, it's not that hard, but it is hard if you want to perfect it. And so I think, um, yeah, so it's not that hard to try to get something that, that has reasonable user experience and at least start there. Yeah, yes, please. So um, kind of going off that, who would you say would be the user in this situation and who would be buying the device and making that decision? Yeah, and these are, again, very critical questions because uh, the form factor, a lot of engineering considerations depend on who's using it. It's not uniform. And uh, so healthcare workers is who, who we target. And so, you know, sometimes people say, oh, you know, are people in, uh, you know, the starving mothers or something like that, you know, are they going to buy this and use it? Okay, that's not our target. Uh, we think healthcare workers, at least, are our initial target. But there could be other users as well. You know, it could be the direct users themselves, which I think is quite far off in the developing world. It could be people in the centralized labs uh, as well. And so we imagine these are people going to the field once in a while in a village. They could carry this in their backpack and do tests. And how would you maintain, like... Um the accuracy of the device over time? Yeah, the hardware is there's no maintenance. If there's any issues, you just ship it back, we'll give you a new one, basically. There's hard, there's internal controls and so forth. You don't need to recalibrate it over time? No. Okay. Yeah, it does it all itself, yeah. Yeah, maybe uh, just one more, one more question, yeah. Uh, this is about a device integration. Um, would you please uh, elaborate a little bit more about exactly what kind of challenges in that area? And you mentioned that there are some that in this year there are more resources. Will that help them to uh, advance in certain ways that's very critical? And in turn, or consequently, then that, of course, will reduce the cost of whatever uh, the, the better uh, picture are going for. So exactly what type, of, what's the reason um, the integration is hard? Is it that people just don't want to do it, or is it a technology uh, issue purely? Well, even just the last couple of years, I love this maker movement. I mean, I think it's fantastic because it is lowering the barrier to people making hardware, you know, uh, closer to the barrier for making software. And Silicon Valley is still a little bit uh, allergic to hardware investments because hardware is always harder, but the barriers are being lowered. And so I think part of the problem before was anyone, so for example, if you're a microfluidics researcher, even an academic researcher, to make something like this was difficult. We're doing everything in-house now in my lab, but that's because we've been working on this for years. At the beginning, we worked with a lot of people, and it took a lot of time, whether they're industrial designers, hardware. You know, we weren't, we weren't experts at the time of making circuit boards. What about doing CAD design, industrial design? What about selecting the material? What the, what's the right plastic material, even, even for things like that? Optical components, mechanical components. It becomes a bigger project than most, you know, individual labs. And, and that's, I think, one reason that people just sort of punt at that and say at some point, you know, this is trivial, this stuff. You know, this is not real science. Somebody will do it. Well, this is actually the crux of the problem, is integrating the whole system together. Now, I think it's different. You know, I think 3D printers, whatever. I mean, universities, we all already have great 3D printers. But, but everyone can really make a lot of this hardware. You can outsource a lot of this stuff. Circuit boards, you can outsource. People will overnight it for you from China. 
it's hardware is becoming much, much easier, even just within the last few years. And that will, I think, uh, if people recognize that, at least in the microfluidics field, I think a lot of people recognize it already in the tech world, but people in our field don't necessarily recognize that yet. And so if they do, they start building these systems. Uh, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll get closer uh, to solving the problem. All right. Uh, thank you, Professor Sia. Um, I think we'll take a quick coffee break and reconvene at 1045.